Hey folks, welcome to a new video. Today we are going to unpack one of the most common pieces of advice given to new artists, why it can sometimes be unhelpful, and what to try instead. This is something that I have talked about a little bit before on this channel, actually probably quite a bit on this channel. It's one of the biggest motivating factors for me in kind of getting my artistic practice off the ground back in the day. So I am super excited to dive into this with you. Um, before we do, we're going to have a quick little message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Learn with Kendall, my brand new online education platform. If you prefer to buy classes a la carte rather than signing up for a subscription, which I know a lot of you do because you have emailed me and told me, this is the place for you. You can buy my individual art classes and have access to them whenever you want without having a monthly membership the way that you need to for Skillshare. So Skillshare is available still, of course, but a lot of you have told me that you prefer to avoid subscriptions, so I am really excited to finally be able to offer this. And to celebrate this launch, all classes purchases on Learn with Kendall through March 19th, 2022, we'll get a free ticket to a live session in April where I'll answer your questions, give critiques, and more. You can see the full class list at learnwithkendall.teachable.com. Okay, so whether you are brand new to art making or whether you've been trying to make art for a while now, you have probably been told some version of the advice. You just need to find your style. And this is one of the most common subjects and pieces of advice for new creators. And that's no surprise at all because having a predictable, consistent style across your body of work is one of the key indicators that you're ready to work with clients or rather that clients would be ready to hire you because they know what they can expect from you looking at your style. And even if you're somebody who's not trying to work with clients, if you're just, you know, doing this for your own kind of personal practice or, um, you know, you're a fine artist, you developing style is still seen as that like kind of key moment of like, yes, I've arrived. Now I'm an artist because I have a style. And the advice on how to find your style often boils down to some version of merge the things that are unique about you and your personality and, you know, the things that you like and your interests and create work that reflects some kind of common combination of those two things. Now, this is not bad advice, and in fact, it can be excellent advice depending on where you are in your creative journey in the particular ways that your personality experiences motivation. But for some folks, this initial focus on style development is kind of like what happens to me when I try really hard to find the rhythm in a song, um, like if I'm at a dance class or, you know, the few times that I have gone dancing, um, you know, trying really hard to find that rhythm so that you can, you know, clap along or dance or follow the steps or whatever. And the way I tend to deal with that is by hyper focusing on, you know, the actual steps, the, the rhythm itself and watching what other people are doing and really trying to, to focus on those steps so that I can mimic them. But the more that I focus on them, the harder that it feels and the further and further I can feel myself kind of drifting away from the rhythm. So I can see people dancing around me. I can see other people, you know, they're following along, they're getting it, they're in the rhythm, but I just can't quite get into it myself no matter how much I focus. And whenever I have asked somebody who has a better sense about this than me, you know, whether it's somebody who's more of a musician than I am or somebody who has more experience dancing, they'll say that what I need to do, and maybe, you know, maybe you know a lot about this and you're going to have other advice for me, but um, I have been told that what I need to do is to kind of relax and stop focusing so much and just kind of feel the, feel the rhythm and get into it more, uh, be more in my body and less in my head. And um, I have found that for myself and for some other creative people, um, creative folks that I have talked to over the years, that trying to kind of hyper fixate and hyper focus on the style question too early on, um, or maybe maybe too early on isn't the right phrase, but at the at the wrong point in their creative journey can kind of have a similar effect, um, and they can land up in a end up land in a situation like I get in when I have been, um, you know, taking a dance class or trying to follow along, you know, in something that requires uh, rhythm. <laughs> and that is that they can end up kind of approaching the creative practice, the creative process from more of an evaluative, evaluative, abstract, kind of idea focused frame of mind only, which makes it really difficult to create actually to, to switch into the creation mode. Because at one level, the creative process really is kind of this back and forth between 
you know, making and evaluating, between growing and culling, writing and editing, and knowing when and how to switch between these modes is really a key skill. And for some of us, myself included, we can have a tendency to get stuck in the abstract analytical idea focus mode and trying to create from that place when your evaluative brain is really keyed up can be kind of like trying to work in the broad light of day of your inner critic, bringing up feelings of self-consciousness that make it even harder to get into the actual process of creating, kind of like hyper-focusing on the rhythm and the steps. And the more you do it, the worse it gets, the harder it is to actually get into it. Now, you all know that I love a good caveat. So here comes the part where I tell you that this framework is, of course, not universal. There are going to be plenty of creative folks who switch seamlessly almost naturally back and forth from their analytic state to their creative state where they can suspend judgment and make. There are people who just seem to have that ability, that, that mode switching almost innate. It's almost natural for them. And I'm sure that there are also folks who can create where they're, while their mind is kind of in that full on analytical critical mode. Um, and if that's you, if you're watching this video and you're thinking like, yeah, that's totally me and things are working well and you're regularly making work and you have found your style um, and you have like a really, you know, kind of thriving, fulfilling creative practice, then great. And <laughs> keep on doing that. Um, this video is probably not for you. This video is more for the folks who have made um, dozens of vision boards or who have pinned a million things uh, on Pinterest to their style inspirations board, or they've written, you know, pages and pages in their bullet journal, listing all the things that they like and are inspired by, um, but have actually yet to make much art or develop any sort of a consistent, regular creative practice. This video is more for the folks who have trouble, um, like me, <laughs> switching from the analytic mode to the making mode. Um, one other little caveat, I do want to be clear that those tactics I just mentioned, making style boards, inspiration boards, lists of the things that you love in your journal, um, I'm not poo-pooing those. Those are excellent things to do. I have given those as piece of, pieces of advice in other videos. So, you know, we're not here to burn down your vision board or to tell you to stop making lists in your planner. Um, those things are all good. You can keep on doing them. We're just here to practice getting switched from that mode to the actual making mode so that you can, you know, use all of that good work, all of that good reflection that you've done and get it, you know, embedded into your work. Okay, so let's unpack a process for doing that, for making that mode switch. The premise here is that you are going to set up a series of tests, a series of different kind of creative prompts or projects with the goal of gathering information about your emotional response to the project itself, to the, the particular process that you engage in. So the ultimate goal here is to uncover a creative process, an artistic process that you truly love for its own sake, a process that you look forward to, that you want to engage in no matter how challenging it feels, a process that feels totally engrossing to you. So since this is going to deal with feelings and feelings are a bit subjective, I'm going to use a few different words. You know, you might hear me use words like enjoyable or engrossing or engaging. Um, basically, what I'm looking for is some kind of feeling of desire to do that process, the you actually wanting to do the process of art making. So for some people, that might mean that it feels challenging. For other people, it might mean for something to for them to have a desire to do something, it feels easy and fun. So that's the part that's kind of subjective, but we're, we're looking for it kind of at a baseline, a, a desire to continue engaging in that process. All right, so to set up these different experiments and to test different processes, you first have to define the parameters, the what you will be testing and the how you will be testing it. So for the what, you're going to be testing, we already kind of just said this, but you're going to be testing how you feel with particular attention to whether you're enjoying yourself or not, whether the experience is an engrossing one or not, whether it's one that you want to continue in, whether it's a direction you want to keep going in. Then for the how, what you're going to do is create a very limited scope creative project. And you're going to do this by constraining the, the creative process on kind of four different fronts. So media, subject, method, and scale. Keep in mind <laughs> to have this actually work as an experience experiment, you have to ask a question that you don't know the answer to yet. You have to create a new container for your experiment, a new container to test. You have to, to test a different kind of process than you have engaged in before. So if you have, for example, been trying to do micron drawings of flowers and feeling totally disinterested in it, and you know, every time you start, you just keep stopping, uh, yeah, every time you start on it, you keep stopping, um, you keep getting stuck, don't base your project on micron floral illustrations because you already know the answer to that 
that question. So don't test a process that you already know isn't working for you. You have to mix up at least one element of it. So um, let's go over those four different elements of a process now. All right, number one is media. So you have to first decide on what type of media you're gonna use in your process and stick to that. So you could try a brand new media, one that you've never worked with before, or maybe one that you tried a long time ago but you haven't used it in a while, or you could use an old favorite that you know you really like. Um, you might even try uh, to limit yourself by saying I can't buy anything new, or you could limit yourself by you know a particular palette, only working with two or three colors, um, or you could find some other way to constrain yourself within the media category. Um, and I would say as a part of this process, really embrace constraint <laughs> and that can be embracing constraint and having tighter limitations on what this process is, is going to make it easier for you to tell if you like it or not. And it also can really kind of unleash creativity in some new ways. So don't be afraid of limiting yourself. Don't be afraid of making the process. Um, I don't want to say the word smaller, but you know, more focused, tighter in some ways that can be something that will actually really help you both in terms of of, you know, figuring out your own response to it and, you know, just actually making something creative in the end. All right, the next one is subject. So this is where you can actually really tap into those lists, those inspirations, all those things that you like, that you've been pinning on your boards, that you've been writing in your journal, that's all gonna come in really handy. Um, when choosing a subject for your project, you could, you know, try pulling directly from some of those things by picking what you're the most interested in first. So pick the low hanging fruit, pick something that feels easy um, and another fun thing to do here is to maybe pick something that um, whether it's justified or not you feel like oh that's not good enough to be real art so pick some kind of subject um, that feels approachable that feels easy that I would say the more stuck you have been the the more in a rut of not being able to make work you have been um, try to be even have, have even lower expectations around what you would do here. So, you know, rather than saying, I'm going to do these, like, I don't know that any beginning artist would ever do this. This is like kind of hyperbole here, but rather than saying, I'm going to do portraits of people on horses, you know, you might just try um, to do little drawings of, I don't know, like different kinds of riding gear that people who know about horses use, something like that. That's a kind of example there. It's, and again, it's an extreme example, but rather than, you know, reaching for the the biggest most like artistically challenging thing if you are really if you have really been stuck in a rut try to make it smaller try to make it easier try to make it a subject that you have a lot of natural interest in number three is the method so um, you know this is kind of related to what we were just talking about but you know maybe if you have felt kind of stuck or hamstrung trying to make really realistic work uh, try experimenting with something that's not so realistic try experimenting with something that's super stylized or maybe on the other hand you felt really limited trying to make non-figurative abstract work um, try to let yourself experiment a little bit with recognizable forms um, method is like such a giant category there's so many different ways to approach this um, this is something that you could you know maybe you would change the subject and the media but you would keep the method the same so maybe if you you really think you do actually like working in realism you would keep realism but you change some of the other two you don't have to make all four of these totally different you can make all four of them totally different but you can also just pick a couple of them to change all right uh, number four scale now uh, this one we has, have all also kind of touched on already but this is such a great way to get yourself unstuck sometimes simply changing the scale of a project alone you know you can keep all of the other things the same but just changing the scale is enough to kind of get you out of a rut so what I mean by scale is the, the actual size and scope of the work so um, making it if you're working pretty large try working really small um, or even like micro super super tiny or if you've been working really tiny try mixing it up and working quite a bit larger um, changing the, uh, the scale of the work, the actual physical size can do wonders for getting you unstuck. Um, that's something that's been definitely true for me. And then along with the scale uh, is the scope. So how many pieces of work you're actually going to do. And that's something that is, I would say, particular to this situation where you're trying to make kind of a constrained experiment. You have to know when the experiment is done. So I would say try to aim for if you're 
if you're having a harder time or if you really don't know what kind of process you'd like or you're not sure at all what kind of direction to go in, make the, the scope much smaller. So try you know two or three pieces. You, you really do need more than one to give it a chance, to give a particular process a chance um, for you to be able to tell how you feel about it. Because sometimes if you just do one, you can either like completely hate it and write it off too early or you can have a fantastic experience with the first one and then realize like on the second or third, that actually it's really not the, the process for you. So I would say on the small end, make it a couple of pieces, but you could make it anywhere from 10 to 12 pieces, especially if you feel like you have a little bit of an inkling of which direction to go in and a type of process that you like. Give yourself a little bit more time, if that's the case, to, to really explore it and really kind of test that hypothesis, test out that experiment. Okay, so those are the four different elements. Now, once you have your parameters described, once you've decided what your process is going to entail, you'll start on the experiment of of actually making that work. Now, when you're doing it, remember that your overarching goal here is not only to make the work, that is a part of the process, of course, <laughs> but uh, what you're looking for here is to gather information about your feelings while you're doing the making. So particularly whether you're enjoying the process or not and whether the process is something that you wanna keep doing. So you have to actually pay attention to your feelings. You have to uh, build that into the process. So um, you can ask yourself how you feel once you get when you're getting started with the work whether you're feeling excited or calm, um, whether you're dreading it, whether you're looking forward to it. You can ask yourself how you feel while you're engaged in the process. So do you, are you enjoying this? Does this feel fun? A really good one for me, a really helpful question um, for me was always to ask whether I lost track of time when I was in the process. And then of course you can ask yourself these same kinds of feelings questions afterwards. So how do you feel when you're not doing it? Uh, do you think about yourself doing it? Do you imagine doing it? Do you look forward to doing it? When you think about doing it again, how does it make you feel in your body? Do you like have the kind of a sinking feeling of dread or do you have like an excited feeling like you can't wait to do it again? So to help yourself pay attention to this, to make sure you don't just get caught up in making the work and judging the success or failure, I don't like those uh, that binary, but judging the, the process, judging the experiment by the end product, by the artwork, um, have a journal or a piece of paper, or something that you can write on near you so that you can interrogate yourself and interrogate your feelings and notice these things. Because again, we're, we're not trying to judge this by what we make. We're trying to judge this, this particular experiment is, is judging how much is evaluating. That's a better word. Evaluating how much we are engaged in the process, how much we enjoy it, how much we want to keep going in that direction. It can also be helpful when you're doing this to have almost like a feelings comparison. So you can think of something else that you like spending time doing that requires some amount of active effort and attention from you. Um, some examples would be like baking or hiking or writing or sewing or playing a sport. It can't be something completely passive like watching TV. And that's not because doing passive things is bad. I'd like to watch TV sometimes. Um, but in terms of comparison, you need to compare an activity that you look forward to doing even though it requires effort and energy from you. So um, pick one of those things, you know what they are for you. So for me, a good example would be like baking um, and then compare how you feel about that thing, um, that thing that you enjoy doing that requires effort to how you feel about this particular kind of uh, creative process. Uh, and then if you really like getting into the nitty gritty and the reflection, you could try even kind of giving yourself a five point scale or a 10 point scale for these different emotions that you might measure or like, you know, enjoyment or engagement, how much you want to do it again, dread, <laughs> um, self-criticism, any of the other things that could kind of creep in and keep that in your journal so that you have something to look back on and trying to do it as much as possible in the moment when it happens. Because sometimes if we look back on something, it can get kind of skewed, even if it's only a couple of hours or a couple of days in the past. So try your best in the moment. Um, just give yourself a minute or two after you finish however much creative process or practice time you have for the day. Um, have a couple of minutes to reflect and journal and, uh, and do that throughout your experiment, throughout your test. So you're gonna do this, you're gonna follow through on the project, you're gonna follow through and finish the pieces you planned in the technique that you planned them, you're gonna do your reflection, uh, and depending on how much time you have to actually engage in your art practice, Finishing one of these test projects might take a few days or it could take a few weeks. It really kind of depends on what your life is like um, and then also the shape of the project that you choose. 
Uh, and then at the end of this time, you're going to look back on your notes and reflect on your feelings. And we're going to come back to that question that's kind of the baseline question that we touched on at the beginning, which is, have you enjoyed this process? Uh, and do you want to keep doing it? So you're not looking at the outcome. You're not looking at the product and asking yourself, is this good or not? Um, you're asking your, yourself how you feel about the process. Do you want to keep doing this process? So if the answer is yes, it's pretty simple. You can keep going in that direction. You might make a change to one element or like a, a small aspect of it. You know, those are those four things, the media, the method, the the media, the subject, the method, the scale, you might make a, a little tweak on one element, or you can just kind of keep going in the exact direction that you found if you if you happen to have really hit on it right away. Um, but if the answer is like, yes, I liked certain parts of it, but you know, maybe not other parts or it really wasn't, you know, I'm not chomping at the bit. I can't like, it's not as though I can wait to get back to it. It was, it was okay. It was good, but you know, it's, it's maybe not the thing. Then try ch changing up a couple of elements of it, at least one, maybe two elements of it. Um, and then build yourself another process experiment, essentially. So you're going to do the same thing all over again. Um, and then it would be another version of that. If it really just didn't land at all, if it really was terrible, if you hated it, then change up multiple aspects of it. And you're going to kind of keep doing this over and over again until you do land on something that actually hits the note for you. Some kind of process that is really engaging, that is really engrossing, that you do feel like, yes, I can, I can do this. I can invest a good amount of energy into this. And then you're going to open up the, um, the scale. You're going to do it on a larger scale. So rather than doing two or three pieces, you'll do 10 or 12 pieces or 20 or 30 pieces. Still, I think, you know, as a beginner, and, and this isn't universal, of course, because none of this advice is for universal. But um, for, for beginners, it can be helpful to have those boundaries. So even if you, you know, you've done your, um, your process, your test within two or three pieces, um, and you know, that was a success and, and a success of being you found a process that you enjoy engaging in, don't just throw caution to the wind and say, like, have no constraints at all. Embrace those constraints and commit to something that's a little bit bit longer, you know, to the um, tune of 10, 20, 30 pieces, whatever it is, whatever it makes sense uh, for you. Don't just, um, you know, hit on something and then, um, you know, find find a direction that seems promising and then completely, you know, um, open it up and have no constraints at all. Um, keep, in, keep those constraints in your life. <laughs> Embrace them as a positive aspect of your creativity. Now, of course, I have no data on this because this is all kind of subjective. And uh, to my knowledge, this is not something that, you know, economists or psychologists or people who study these things have like really broad um, research studies on. But part of the reason I think that this can be helpful, this kind of refocusing on the process can be helpful for some folks, is that as artists, as creators, as I think just like human beings in the West, <laughs> we learn to measure our success by how we feel about the end product, by how we feel about the results, um, and sometimes, unfortunately, by how other people feel about the results, and not by how deeply we engage in the process and by how satisfying we find the process. And I think that a large part of that is because we just live in a world, in a society that values commodities. And while art, especially commercial art, does have a place in that world, uh, trying to chase the product, divorce from the process, divorce from how we feel about engaging in the process can be really challenging. So if you are really stuck and you cannot get into a groove with your art practice, no matter what you try, switching your focus from the end product to how you feel about the process and really trying to chase joy and engagement in the process rather than accomplishment in the product can really help kind of shake things up. And the amazing thing is that with time, as you engage more and more deeply in a process that you love, you'll end up developing skills because you'll have more patience for that process and you'll grow more as an artist and you'll develop a style, you will develop a style, and you'll create work that's satisfying both in terms of the end product, what you actually make, uh, as well as the process itself, which in my book is the holy grail of art making. That's kind of what I'm aiming for. And I think that's what a lot of us are aiming for, wanting to feel proud of the work that we make and also wanting to enjoy 
enjoy the process of making it. So um, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it with somebody you know who might also need to hear it. Uh, of course, as always, if you have questions, thoughts, things that you'd like to see in future videos, you can drop those in the comments. Thank you very much to Meg for editing this video. Thank you to my patrons for sponsoring it. Um, thank you all of you for watching and I hope you have a great day and I will see you the next time, in the next time, in the next video. All right, bye.